Today on State of the Rockets, we're going to be talking about Jay Sean Tate, Christian Wood, and we might even rehash a little Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook trade talk, given that Chris Paul had an incredible and phenomenal game to close out the first round against the Pelicans last night. So stay tuned. Welcome back to State of the Rockets, the premier Houston Rockets podcast, baby. I am your host, Roosh Williams, Roosh Willigan, the Mastodon. Um, I am also the host of the Noble and Roosh show presented by Ball is Life. It's the number one podcast on the Ball is Life network where we interview NBA players, journalists, beat writers, NBA Twitter people, all that kind of stuff. So check that out anywhere you get your podcasts. And then Jackson Gatlin, take it away. I am your other host here at State of the Rockets. I also host Locked on Rockets five days a week covering your Houston Rockets. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, three interviews from around the NBA landscape, the biggest stories to start your week off right, and then the founder of ClutchCityControlRoom.com, all Houston, all hoops. Be sure to follow me along on Twitter at JT Gatlin. That's Jackson Taylor Gatlin, as in Taylor Swift, who is absolutely bay. She is my favorite. Um, and you can follow the the Mastodon himself at Roosh Williams. And yeah, we've got a lot to get into today with uh, Jay Sean Tate and some Christian Wood. And then maybe again, uh, peeling back the scab that is the uh, the CP3 trade from back in the day. It's, it you know, weird to say that back in the day. Ooh, I know. This is almost three years ago. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. It's just it's just funny because discussing it on Twitter doesn't really do it justice. You know, I can't no. I can't go back in 280 characters with like threads and people chiming in to really get to the root of that whole thing, because I, I vehemently disagree with the other side of the argument. But anyways, so Clutch fans, shout out to Clutch fans, tweeted something to the effect of, hey, the Rockets might want to look into trading Jay Sean Tate. Um, and the reasons are, look. <clears throat> I think we all love Jay Sean Tate. I think we all love what he brings to the table. Um, he gets the PJ Tucker comparisons, and you know, a lot of people say, "Hey, if you trade Jay Sean Tate, look at what PJ Tucker's doing in Miami," and that's a valid thing to say. Um, but obviously, PJ Tucker is helping a team that's ready to contend, whereas the Rockets aren't, and that's kind of the issue with Tate. He's 25, I think 26, maybe um, has his limitations. Um, and so, so yeah, basically, Clutch fans was saying, "Look, if you want." to get value before you have to re-up his contract because Jay Sean Tate is a restricted free agent. So this is his last season under contract with the Rockets this upcoming season. Um, and so you have to figure out how much money you want to you want to attach to him and spend on him, right? And the Rockets are kind of structuring things to have a clean cap sheet in 2023. And giving Kevin Porter Jr. money is, is a discussion on the table. And then doing the same with Jay Sean Tate is a discussion on the table. So if you start locking up that cap by paying these guys, you got to do it in a smart manner. And Jay Sean Tate could command, I don't know, maybe the MLE or more uh, from a contender for his services, right? And as an undersized power forward for the Rockets at 6'4 that can't shoot the three ball, um, you kind of have to look at, at how he fits. I think usage-wise, he he was around like 18 19%. Um, and the Rockets have several kind of I wouldn't say high usage guys, but they're in that mid range, right? You got like Shingun, 22%, KPJ and Jalen Green around 23 and Christian Wood all around like 23, 24%. Eric Gordon somewhere around 18, 19%. Jay Sean Tate somewhere around 18, 19%. It gets hard. It gets hard to build a team that can actually win and cohesively play together when you got all that, all that usage. And sometimes it helps to do some addition by subtraction and get some lower usage players that kind of stick to their role. So to be clear, <clears throat> I love Jay Sean Tate. I mean, I love his bulldog mentality. I love the defense. I love how I know he's not going to give up on any play, and I can rely on that. But at the same time, is he a piece of the future moving forward? And if he's not, should the Rockets look to trade him? Um, let's get into it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we we kind of lumped when we did our our you know season grades in review. We focused on the the young core, you know, quote unquote. And we lumped Jay Sean Tate in with that group, namely or mainly because didn't you give Jay Sean Tate a C? I did. He was my lowest grade. It was <laughs> okay. because he had a down year. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna you know front about it. I'm gonna stick to that. I'm gonna stick to my guns on that. But and again, we'll we'll further unpack that. But 
you know, I think it was maybe a little telling that the Rockets lumped him in with the rest of the young core, right? When they did the exit interviews, they staged their exit interviews in kind of two parts. So they did the veteran exit interviews Sunday night, the the final night of the season later on after the Atlanta Hawks game, like all the vets like stayed after, I guess. And they just, you know, knocked out their exit interviews that night. And then all the young guys, I seemingly, I guess, just got to go home and then come back that Monday morning and do their exit interviews then. And that's when they got their media availabilities and all that. So that's why there was no Christian Wood or John Wall or Eric Gordon, like exit interview with the media because they knocked out theirs early. So I think it's a little telling that Jay Sean was lumped in with the rest of the young guys and Christian Wood was not. And maybe that's just circumstantial, whatever, whatever. But with Jay Sean Tate, you know, I, I, I vacillate back and forth because I really think that he is everything you want from that, like, He's almost like your prototypical like enforcer that like that dog that you want to have on a championship team, right? That's why he draws the comparisons to the PJ Tuckers or, you know, maybe like the Patrick Beverly's obviously different positions and stuff, but right? That mentality, right? That guy who's going to get under the skin of the opposing team a little bit. He's going to be your bulldog. He's going to do all the dirty work that needs to be done to try and win you a game. And he makes winning basketball plays. Like, I'm not trying to take anything away from him, but I think you hit the nail on the head there. And that's a guy who knows his role, right? Like a guy who knows, you know, stays in his lane, knows his role. And I think for Jay Sean Tate this past season, especially, he was much more susceptible to not doing that and that's just our perception of it right it could very well be that the coaching staff wanted more from him right they wanted him to attack more they wanted him to be you know more uh, aggressive offensively and trying to find his spots where he could score on the interior against you know mismatches that he thought were you know favorable to him if he's got a, a bigger slower guy checking him since he's an undersized four maybe that was something that they were trying to take advantage of but to us as consumers uh, of the product and just kind of watching the game, it did feel like at times he was, you know, tunnel vision, right? Like, you know, attacking, not necessarily the, the, the playmaking version, the point forward esque version of Jay Sean Tate that we all kind of fell in love with during his rookie campaign. Cause that's what I thought made him such a dynamic player and why, even despite the shooting, I was like, yo, there's like, there's flashes of Draymond in his game a little bit, right? If he can be like that point forward and kind of run the offense a little bit, and you can get some guy, you can get guys some easier looks if he's got the ball in his hands and he's like running the show, setting setting some things up. And he did that his rookie year. Felt like he took a gigantic step back and didn't do that nearly as much in his sophomore campaign. And then you couple that with the shooting woes and all that, it does draw this gigantic question mark of is he the right fit alongside some of these guys? Is he the right fit alongside Jalen Green, KPJ, whoever else moving forward? But to say. I still think he's like a, he could be a top eight or nine guy on a team. Do you think, do you think if you were to like airdrop him on a playoff team right now, it doesn't matter like which one, you know, just any random playoff team. Do you think he'd be able to crack like an eight or nine man playoff rotation? I think he would like for everything so. he brings to the table. It, I think so. It just depends on if that team has shooting. I mean, look, we, we got on the double big lineup. The truth of the matter is that Jay Sean Tate, Daniel Tice would have worked in Houston if Jay Sean Tate was replaced with somebody that could shoot. He shot 30, I think 31% from three this season. Um, he's six foot four. Like if you're going to have the skill set he has and play the role that he plays, you, I mean, he's got to be at least six, six or six, eight, right? Preferably six, eight. If you want to take the Draymond comparison, six, six, but you got to remember that Draymond's a special player, uh, an all time special player, right? With an insane yeah. wingspan too, to make with up an insane wingspan, which is part of the reason he's able to, to compensate um, to, for his lack of height against bigs. And look, we saw a lot of playmaking from Jay Sean Tate. The assist numbers are very similar from this season to last season. So you could point to that and say, hey, he's still making plays. But if you watch the games, you just saw a lot more ISO from Tate. A lot more like, you know, or I knew when he was catching the ball at the elbow or at the, the perimeter, whatever, he was going to make that two dribble spin move, you know, pump fake, left-handed hook off the glass. Like that, that, he did that so many times. And there were times where it worked and the Rockets needed a bucket and it was great. But then there are other times where you're just like, Man, you drew you drew defenders. You should be looking to move the ball. You, you should not be looking to score. Now, the other thing to bring up is that, well, we already talked about it. He's in a contract year. So what comes with that? You know, a guy trying to prove himself. Christian Wood, contract year. Uh, Eric Gordon, not going to be guaranteed for another year after next season. Uh, Kevin Porter Jr., restricted free agent. Jay Sean Tate, restricted free agent, right? So, like, these things start to conflict because guys need to get theirs because guys need to get paid. And that's not a knock on them. 
that's just the reality of the situation, right? Jayshon Tate needs – this is – he he came in on a very team-friendly deal, and he is 20 – I think 26, 25 or 26. But he's about to enter that window where he needs to get his payday. And so his production statistically next season is very important to him because he needs to get his payday. This is his one chance to get his fat NBA paycheck, right? Get locked up for three or four years for as much money per year as he possibly can. And so I don't blame him. Um, but in the, but in the discussion of is that going to be winning basketball and is that the type of basketball for a guy that needs to play his role? Probably not, right? Now, the other issue with Jay Sean Tate is that the guy behind him who – was sporadically getting playing time and who got more playing time actually last season is KJ Martin. And KJ Martin doesn't do some of the things that Jay Sean Tate does. He's a different player. He's also not a, a four. He's not a power forward. He's not really even a three by skill, but he could, he can play the three technically. Um, but he's bigger. He's six foot six. He can jump higher. He can block shots. He can be a, a weak side shot blocker rim protector in that manner not like someone who's going to you know guard post ups and absorb contact like that but he can help over from the weak side and block shots and he can shoot the three uh, i don't know what he ended the season at but i, I think it was 35 percent, 36 percent, some somewhere around there he was at 36 percent, and i think he dipped off right at the end to around 35 maybe like just under 35 but he can shoot the three um if jay sean tate is left open it's a win for the defense kj martin not so much kj martin also gives you that energy that jay sean tate gives you and he can finish at the rim. He keeps balls alive. He has a surprisingly good touch around around the rim. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I mean, you know, he gets out in transition, finishes above the rim. I just think that we're kind of at a point where Jay Sean Tate is, like I said, the age that he is. And he could really help a team. But I don't know if he's going to help a rebuilding team that's still trying to find its identity with all these different offensive weapons. I think you, I think you could really benefit from a guy like K.J. Martin who's not going to be taking up possessions. When he gets the ball, he's just looking to hand it off to someone, move, and then get open so he can either catch and shoot or catch a dunk and finish, right? And I think that release valve really helps things, especially with the emergence we saw with Jalen Green and KJ, uh, KPJ at the end of the season, right? I want to say, I might have this wrong. I'm, I'm going to try to I have it pulled up, so let me just take a quick look. But I want to say that towards the end of the season, uh, in games where the Rockets played Jay Sean Tate less, it was actually to their benefit. Um, you know, what? They played the Raptors. He played 26 minutes. They lost by two. They played the T-Wolves. He only played 20 minutes. They lost by seven. And I think that was a game where they came back with him off the bench um, or with him off the court. You know, yeah, he started playing like closer to the 20s instead of the 30s down the stretch. And I feel like just the eye test, the Rockets looked better with him off the court, which again, it's one of those weird things where it fits, fits a weird thing, you know? You can take a guy that is individually better than other players, and if he doesn't fit with the players that he's playing with, this is not going to work out. So, so yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of where I'm at. I'm I'm of the thinking that when this team is ready to be good in about two, maybe three years, and Jay Sean Tate's 29 years old, um, are you really, you know, is he really a part of that timeline? Is, is he someone that you want to give, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten million dollars per year to if he commands that on the market? Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he commands way less. If it's like three or four million, maybe we're having a different discussion, right? I'm assuming some contender will want to pay him um, to kind of add him as a piece, but trading him for a pick could also work. When people make the PJ Tucker comparisons, they need to remember PJ Tucker hit the three ball. You know, PJ Tucker is one of the leading three point makers from the corner in the last however many years, basically since he started playing for the Rockets, right? Uh, and if Jay Sean Tate can't do that, then throw the P.J. Tucker comparisons out the window. P.J. Tucker also guarded bigs. Jay Sean Tate kind of can, but he also can't, right? Like like a the, the big five, the big heavy fives, P.J. Tucker was stronger and I think weighed a little bit more and could absorb that contact with a lower center of gravity. Um, and, and keep in mind, when P.J. Tucker's played his first season in Houston, Ryan Anderson started because P.J. Tucker's reliability from three was in question. And then once he proved that, it was like, okay, this is the guy. And that's what the Rockets did. But Jay Sean Tate's not going to be P.J. Tucker unless he's able to hit at least 35% from three. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I don't think P.J. Tucker ever hit less than 35% from three in a Rockets uniform. I'm not even sure he hit less than 36 or 37%. If you could look that up while I'm speaking. I, I, are, I actually already pulled it up. I'm one step ahead of you. Um, <laughs> he actually did, where is it? Um, Houston... Yeah, so now as a Houston Rocket, he shot over 35% all three seasons that he played, like legitimate, meaningful seasons. I'm not going to count the uh, season where he was, you know, 
mentally checked out the start of the uh you know the start of the downfall of the houston rockets uh, can you give me the percentages year by year yeah sure so his very first year in houston 37 percent, then 38 percent, or a skosh under 38 percent uh 36 percent in the 2019 2020 campaign so the russell westbrook year and then the his final you know season he what played 32 something games before the Rockets, you know, moved, traded him, uh, 31%, but he was mentally checked out that final season. And, so. and if, if anyone remembers during that season where he was checked out, uh, we were all saying like, Hey, stop playing PJ Tucker. It's not working anymore. Right? Like the Harden dynamic is gone. His, his value is now changed. Like this is a totally different team. They play differently. He's just not the same player. He's kind of mucking things up. So if you got him in the right role, it works. But if, if a guy like that cannot shoot and space the floor and make the defense respect where he's standing, it just doesn't work out. You know, I do wonder because there. So if you look earlier in PJ Tucker's career, which again, he's, you know, PJ Tucker also, or I should say, Jay Sean Tate also draws a lot of the PJ Tucker comparisons because they both went, you know, the roundabout way to make it to the NBA, right? They did their stint overseas. They didn't exactly get the, you know, the super easy, you know, easy breezy beautiful cover girl path of like you know college or g league and then straight to the nba they had to like grind to make it to the nba they started as older rookies all that stuff but with pj tucker specifically you go back to you know his earlier seasons and first few seasons with phoenix i mean he had a one season where he shot 31 percent from three then the following season he goes up to 39 percent then he's back down to 34 and a half percent he's back down to 33 percent so he kind of like, you know, was, I don't want to say waffling with the three point shot. And the distinction to me is that Jay Sean Tate's shot isn't bad. Like, it's not like a broken shot. Like, he doesn't look like he has a bad shot. It's a good looking shot. And so maybe there's that still, that still, that little bit of hope that if you did hold on to Jay Sean Tate, right? Even if they, you know, threw like the MLE at him or something, you know, eight, 10 million something a year that maybe he gets it figured out, right? And he gets that percentage up to a more respectable number, 33, 34, 35. I think that's kind of the holdout and the hope for a lot of Rockets fans who are still incredibly high on what Jay Sean Tate brings to the table. That said, if we take the the red-tinted Rocket shades off for a minute, I get it. I love Jay Sean Tate too. I love everything he brings to the table. I love the mentality, the maturity, all of it. I think players sometimes are who they are by the time they're like, 24 or 25 like i think expecting you know drastic changes and improvements in their game past that point is almost setting yourself up for disappointment right like i don't want to sit here and think that oh yeah two three years down the line like maybe jay sean tate has like a, a reliable and effective jump shot i would love to be wrong especially if the rockets decide that they want to keep him long term because that would be a very welcome development because then suddenly you're talking about a guy that could be one of the premier three and D type guys in the league. If you get to play him at the three spot instead of the four spot as an undersized four. And then if he's got a three point shot, that's consistent, you package that with all the other, you know, the versatility that he provides you offensively. He's not as one dimensional as a guy like PJ Tucker, who can, you know, is a bit limited on offense, right? He's a catch and shoot guy from the corner. Maybe he can dribble it in and hit that little like baby hook that he's got in the paint. And that's about it. Like he's not going to PJ Tucker's not gonna be out there, like crossing somebody up or like scoring in isolation, getting his own buckets. So there's some pros and cons to each of those guys. But the biggest con for Jay Shantae is the fact that he just can't get the shot to go in. But I don't think it's anything mechanical. Like the shot looks good every time he releases it. And that's maybe that's, you know, bodes well for the future. But again, I don't want to set myself up for ex expecting him to suddenly become a good three point shooter overnight or even over the course of the next few seasons. Yeah, and the thing to remember when you're talking about PJ Tucker's like percentages waffling, you got to credit the Rockets. They found where he hits it from, and that's the corner. And, and if anyone doesn't know this, the corner is shorter than the rest. The corner three pointer is a shorter distance from the basket than the other three pointers by like a foot or a half a foot or something, something like that. It's like 22 something feet. Uh, and the normal three point shot, I think, is like 23 feet and seven inches or some, something like that. If you want to look that up, Jackson, go for it. I don't know off the top of my head, but <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not pulling that stat, but I will hit you with an aside here really quick. Where do you like to shoot from on the court? I hate the corners. Like, um, I don't, I don't like the corner, but I'll, anywhere I'll shoot that bitch from anywhere. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> no, but like, but everybody has their like sweet spot on the court. Like I, I prefer like the, the slot, like give me either of the slots. Like I'm, you know, no. top of the key is like, or like, okay. I hate the corners. Give me, give me that ball on the wing, like in the slot. Like that's where I want to pull the trigger from. If I'm taking a three ball, like personally, so look, when I, when I was younger, I played a lot at, 
uh, I played a lot of pickup at 24 hour fitness, right? <clears throat> like you can't on a school team, you can't play the way you play at a gym because you got to do what coach says. But at the gym, I'd be playing with the big boys at like 6 p.m., right? And the only way I could get on the court because they were all, you know, I don't know back. I don't know what it is now, but back then they were like guys that played overseas, guys that played in college, like, you know, legitimate six foot five and above athletes that were hooping. And so the only way I got on the court was by hitting threes. And the way I had to do that was by getting my shot off over guys bigger than me. So I just learned how to back up and shoot from ass deep. Right. So like before Steph Curry, before Steph Curry was, was doing what Steph Curry was doing at Davidson, like we were, me and my friends were just jacking threes because that's how we got on the court um, against the big boys. And so I say that to say, I'll shoot that bitch from anywhere. Like still to this day, like that, that's my MO. I shoot that. Bitch. I don't, I don't care where I'm at. I don't care if I'm off one foot. I don't care if I dribbled or not. I don't care if I dribbled the wrong way. I'll shoot that bitch from anywhere. Uh, that being said, I don't like the corners because I like to shoot from far. And so the muscle memory is a little messed up when I'm in the corner. Cause I cause tell you, I, I would call you Roosh Curry, but I feel like coming from a white guy, that's got some like racial undertones to it. And I can't get away with that. So we're not going to yeah, I mean, do you, that. I'm not trying to get canceled. You've played with me. You know that, that I it have played with you. I know, I know that the jumper is there. I know it's very it real. Let's, let's, but that's why I was, I was trying to figure out if you got like a secret sweet spot on the court that like I, I wasn't, you know, picking up on. But I, I, I respect. I mean, it. I, look, if I'm like playing like one on one or something, because when it's five on five, you just got to you got to get that sliver of, of space and just let it rip. If it's one on one, I like to just like take a bounce to the left and then rip it. But um, or I shoot it straight off the catch. Like I'll just triple threat, you know, off the checkup, triple threat, boom, 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 one dribble, bang. So. That's how I get down. Um, and I'm hoping, man, I got this huge brace on my ankle. You can't see because my ankle's down there. But I have an enormous brace on my ankle. And yesterday I went to the gym. For anyone that doesn't know, I, I tore it up two months ago. So it's been destroyed. It's still swollen. Went to the gym yesterday, did some workouts. It felt good. So we might get back to action on Sunday. But we digress. So <clears throat> um, what I was going to say, though, is credit the Rockets for finding – the spot where PJ Tucker is useful from, because he's not a good three point shooter from the elbow. He's not a good three point shooter from the top of the arc. He's a good three point shooter from the corner. And that distant, that change in distance matters, not because he's not strong enough to make it, but muscle memory is shooting is all about muscle memory, right? That's why if you're a good shooter and you haven't, like I've been lifting, I haven't been shooting, I haven't played basketball for over two months, right? Um, and I've been lifting weights, so my shot's gonna be a little messed up. But once I get in the gym and just shoot around for 30 minutes, I'll recalibrate and the muscle memory will click back into place. And so for a guy like PJ Tucker, that muscle memory from the corner is automatic. You know, that's why it doesn't matter if someone's in his face. That's why it doesn't matter, you know, what the circumstances are. The muscle memory is there. He's automatic for the most part. And he had, I think he shot above 40% this season, but from other places it doesn't work. And so if Jay Sean Tate can find a place on the court where he is like, that's his spot. Hey, Jay Sean Tate shooting 38, 39% from that spot on the court and the Rockets can get him in that spot frequently. Maybe things are different, but I, I agree with you. After a certain point, most guys are what they are. And, you know, even though the shot doesn't look ugly, there's a certain confidence and rhythm that comes with shooting and he just doesn't have it. It's almost like some of the shots that he made from three didn't look like they were going to go in. Like, I remember he made a couple step back threes uh, late in the season. And when Those he shot wild, right, where he like he, he like forced <laughs> into the step back, like defense closes out shot clock running down. And he's like, let me just step back into this. And he's like falling away. And it's not even like a it doesn't look like a super clean step back. It was not we're a pretty step back. <laughs> no, we were conditioned into like the, the, you know, hyper unrealistic, like clean step backs from James Harden. But these like falling down, like almost like a fade away from the three point line. It was a trip. It went in. So and it went in. But but that that kind of tells you like he does not have his go to shot down and he's just not a shooter. So look, if he's getting paid, <clears throat> I don't think there's any way I'm paying him eight, nine, ten million if I'm the Rockets, unless he proves he can shoot. Um and that's I mean, I think that's really that. You know, I think he could be valuable as a throw in for a trade. I think you could even maybe trade him straight up for like a late first round pick. I know people don't want to hear that, but I would what I would do if I'm the Rockets is I would bring him off the bench next season. And it depends on who they draft. It depends on who they sign in free agency, if they sign anyone noteworthy. And it depends on if they make a trade, because Rafael Stone specifically said that he, he said something about hoping that the Rockets have compelling trade packages, trade offers to make. So maybe they're looking that route. But if they if they bring back this team as is and only add the rookies that they intend to draft this offseason, I would bring Jay Sean Tate off the bench and I'm starting KJ Martin over him. And I'm seeing what that does because Jalen Green and KPJ took over last season 
and they just need someone who's there to catch and shoot when they get doubled or when the defense, you know, sags into the paint and they need someone to hit that baseline cut and just rise up and catch and finish. You know, they need that more so than they need what Jay Sean Tate brings. They don't need a guy that can pirouette through the lane and do some fakes and and do a left-handed hook off the glass at six foot four. You know, they don't need a guy that <clears throat> can kind of post up and score at six foot four, right? They've got Alper and Shingun. They don't need Jay Sean Tate to be that. Um, and in that discussion, I think also kind of segues into the other guy we're going to talk about. Let me let me drop in one more point here on Jay Sean Tate before we segue into our other guy. And that's first off, uh, in that original framework discussion that, that kind of kickstarted this conversation uh, by Dave Hardesty, clutch fans himself, the OG, uh, he revisited uh, a conversation with Kevin O'Connor from the ringer on Twitter and, and just kind of asked KOC's thoughts about, you know, what he thought Jay Sean Tate's value would be. And, and KOC basically said a late first. So, you know, if that's the, if we're operating under that assumption that Jay Sean Tate is worth a late first, then I don't think necessarily you're exploring trading Jay Sean Tate for a late first in this year's draft, given the fact that we already know that the Rockets were, you know, they didn't want any more late firsts in this year's draft. They wanted future firsts if they were going to orchestrate any trades for Eric Gordon or Christian Wood at the deadline, and there were just no teams willing to put future firsts on the table. I think that if you're looking at moving Jay Sean Tate either potentially this summer or just a little bit further down the line, that is probably a solid valuation for him is, you know, about, you know, a late first round draft pick, give or take somewhere. Um, but again, it's really important to remember with those draft assets, the further out they are, the more valuable they are, because obviously you've got more time for, for them to mature. You've got the fact that you can, you know, choose to, you know, liquidate that asset, trade it again in another package, whatever. Whereas if you trade him right now and you have to make that pick, then you're kind of, you're just, you're just stuck with whatever prospect you get. And suddenly you don't have the flexibility of having that pick to grease the wheels on another trade further down the line, whatever. Let me but, also say, oh, sorry. I thought, I thought you were going to go to the next topic. Are you? Are you still no, going? no, no. It's still, still on Jay Shante. Still on Jay Shante. Um, I, I think too, and, and you kind of brought this up. It brought brought this point up and kind of alluded to it. But it was the growth of KPJ and Jalen Green as the season went on. Where maybe earlier in the season, yeah, like it was nice having Jay Shante in the starting lineup as like that safety valve, being able to like you know he could handle the rock a little bit and he could kind of take over situationally if you know if things got stagnant with KPJ or Jalen they just you know couldn't find something within a given offensive set sure but then as the season went on and as we saw KPJ kind of come into his own Jalen Green come into his into his own you don't need another guy out there who's trying to take reps away from those guys you need somebody who's going to stay in his lane do his role and that skill set that Jay Sean Tate has could be really enticing coming off the bench, right? Because then you, he's that burst of energy off the bench, 20, 25 minutes where he can come in and, and, you know, score again, you know, have that whole array of his offensive repertoire against some weaker bench units. And we could easily see Jay Sean Tate be maybe not like a six man type role, but just come off the bench, get his buckets, set some teammates up. And he's not doing it to the detriment of the ball, not being in the hands of Kevin Porter Jr. Jalen green when he is, you know, trying to just get the rock and get his. So the last thing I want to say about Jay Sean Tate, and I think this is possibly the most important thing about, about him as, as he fits with the Rockets, uh, the Rockets biggest, I mean, they had a ton of issues, but their biggest issue was defense. They were terrible at defense, right? They were better on defense when Daniel Tice was starting with Christian Wood, but they were so bad on offense because Jay Sean Tate was your small forward that couldn't shoot at all. And then Daniel Tice is out of the rotation, gets traded. Now Jay Sean Tate's your power forward. So, what was the biggest issue for the Rockets? Getting whooped by big men, right? The other team's random big man on any given team, on any given night, right? Goga Batadze had like a career night against the Rockets, right? Like any anyone that was above six foot nine on the other team destroyed the Houston Rockets. Now, why is that? Because Jay Sean Tate, we, we blame Christian Wood a lot. And Christian Wood is is not good defensively, and he deserves a lot of blame for that. But that was exacerbated as well by the fact that Deshaun Tate was your power forward. So you got Christian Wood, who's not really a five and who's not heavy enough to play the five, guarding the five. And then you got Deshaun Tate, who is not tall enough, not near tall enough to play the four. Playing the four, right? So your interior defense was Swiss cheese for this reason. And then in addition to that, he can't shoot. So it, it's almost like, <clears throat> well, it's not even almost like. It is like you put him at the four, you get beat up inside. You put him on the three. You don't have enough spacing to spread the floor. And his perimeter defense, I don't want to say it's overrated, but it's it's 
not as valuable given all the other factors. Like, okay, he's playing perimeter defense, you know, with tenacity and he's playing it well, but does that outweigh the fact that he's that the defense is leaving him wide open and mucking up the entire offense? Does that does that outweigh the fact that when he gets switched on to the big as the power forward at the four, that he's gonna get beat up, even though he's like scrapping and trying, he's still gonna get beat up down there and or he's gonna get shot over, which happened frequently. So those are the things you have to consider. Like as individually good as he is, when you're constructing the team and addressing the weaknesses of the team, a lot of it was because Silas was kind of using Jay Sean Tate to be his like, you know, his versatile bandage or patch to just patch things up. When in reality, if he would have just been brought off the bench and you start someone else at the three that could actually shoot next to Tyson Wood, we might have seen something different. I know people don't want to hear that, but we might have seen something different. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of Rockets fans have uh, an un, undeserving vendetta against Daniel Tice when he really, again, the issues didn't just stem from him. It was it was a bunch of different factors at play. I do, I, I'm maybe a bit more hesitant to lump that blame directly on Tate, if only because, like you said, well, right, he, he was he was being deployed as like that that you know adhesive bandage of like, yo, Christian Wood can't play defense, so let's let Jay Sean Tate check Avika Zubats because Christian that, Wood. That's what I'm him. saying, and. And that's unfortunate that he was put in that. But right, weren't you? You highlighted earlier that, or later, later in the season, right? You were at that Clippers game. Oh, the Clippers game, game, yeah. Tate, you, Tate would pick up Zubats, and and Wood was just like drifting, you know. And then, yeah, but but that's what I'm saying, right? I'm not saying, oh, it's Tate's fault. He sucks. I'm saying he was used in this manner, yeah, because the Rockets had no one else, but also because he he's above average at defense so he's like plugged in to become like this defensive stopper on all fronts that he's not and then his offensive week like he he should be you know a 20 20 minute a night bench guy that comes in gives you versatility but if he's starting at the 4 i mean we saw what happened right interior defense swiss cheese if he's starting at the 3 everyone else has to be able to shoot and even if even if that's the case even in the lineups where everyone else can shoot the spacing is still killed by his presence so it's tough does that, that and that was going to be uh, does your mentality change at all right cuz obviously there's so much up in the air going into next season about what this team is going to look like what the roster makeup is going to look like that's why we're having some of these discussions in the first place you know who's going to start who deserves to start whatever i'm still of the opinion and i think you are as well that kj martin should probably be the starting 3 next season but right now, there's probably three guys that are in the running for that spot. Jay Sean Tate being one of them. Eric Gordon potentially being one of them. But I think Eric Gordon gets lumped in that same conversation of... Yeah, he's misused he, as a three. He's not a three. He's not. And, and they have him out there because they want the the veteran support. They want him to be out there in case, right, KPJ, Jalen Green need a bailout, right? Because... EG can just sit on the perimeter, stretch the floor out to 30 some odd feet. And then when the shot clock gets down to 10 seconds and they still haven't developed anything for the play, it's like, oh crap, just give the ball to EG and he's just going to bully ball his way in for, for two. And that's like, I think EG is a complimentary vet. He doesn't need the ball in his hands, right? He just stands on the perimeter. He stretches the defense. It kind of works, but he's not a three. So that said, if the Rockets were to say, pick up Jabari Smith in this year's draft. And maybe they still hold on to Christian Wood. They're not ready to pull the trigger on Alper and Shingun being the starting five of the future. And Christian Wood is around for the long haul. Does that change your perception at all? If that's your lineup, if it's KPJ, Jalen Green, Christian Wood, Jabari Smith, all certified solid shooters, incredible shooters, you know, by the numbers, they're all great because Jalen Green really started to come around towards the end of the season. Would you then be more comfortable starting Jay Sean Tate at the three in that lineup, or would you still want to see KJ Martin? Because I'm kind of torn. I think I'd I would. I would still want KJ. I would still want to see KJ, um, just because you're more potent when everyone is at least a 35 percent caliber three point shooter, right? I would even go so far as to say, for offensive purposes, I'd like to see Shangun, Jabari Smith, KJ Martin, Jalen Green, KPJ, and we'll talk about Christian Wood. We can talk about him now, but. Look, if you start, if you if you put K, if you put Jay Sean Tate on the bench, and you start um, KPJ, Jalen Green, Jabari Smith, let's say Shingun and KJ Martin, your shortest player is now six foot five on the on the court, and it's your guard instead of a six foot four three or a six foot four power forward, which would be Jay Sean Tate, right? And so, <clears throat> again, the Rockets' biggest issue for the first part of the season it was that they. They had no spacing to do anything on offense, right? They were actually decent on de at one point in the season, like 10 or so games into the season, they were like 12th on defense, believe it or not. But they were so bad on offense, like so far under everyone else in the league on offense that it didn't work. So you make the switch and then what happens? They're historically bad on defense. Um, so 
I would just like 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 imagine if the Rockets had two guys in the front court that were at least six foot nine and above. We didn't see that last season. The only time, only time we saw that last season after the Tice stuff was when Wood and Shingun would share the court. Now that gets us to our next <clears throat> our next topic, Christian Wood. Where do we stand on Christian Wood? Um, I think Christian Wood has the same issue as Jay Sean Tate in a different kind of way. Christian Wood was played at the five. He's not a five. Christian Wood at the four. Um, he can be a four, but he almost plays like he wants to be a three in a four's body. And it's weird because on defense, he's really bad inside. He's he's actually better on the perimeter than he is inside because even though he's not super quick laterally, he's long enough and he's quick enough and long enough to cover ground and to close out like over the top, right? Um, whereas inside, you can just, if someone's got the weight on him, they will bully him and he's not physical enough to, to scrap and fight. So that is an issue. Um, and then on the offensive end of the floor, like we saw him coming off pin downs, drags, screens. You see him get the ball on ISO from the from the three point line, like he's KD. I want him to play like a stretch four. You know, I don't want him to post up or anything. But that's the thing, right? If Christian Wood needs the ball to operate from the perimeter, then what are you going to do with Jalen Green and KPJ? You know, at some point you got to pick two out of those three. If you could do me a favor and pull up uh, the usage percent of Christian Wood. And KPJ, I think Jalen Green's was 23.7%. His usage took like a – it skyrocketed because of the end of the season. He started getting a lot of usage, so it went from like somewhere in the 22 percentile to up to the 23, almost to 24. I'm pretty sure KPJ was 23, high 23, possibly 24. And I'm pretty sure Christian Wood was – yeah, hit me. Hey. KPJ was 24.1% usage okay. rating, and Christian Wood was – 23.3 for the season. There you, there you go. So we talked all season on Twitter about the lack of hierarchy with the offense, right? And and those numbers right there should tell you exactly what you need to know. And uh, can you confirm Jalen Green, 23.7%? I will have that one in a moment. So KPJ, 24.1%. Christian Wood, I forgot. You said 23 point whatever. 23 something. 23 point, 23.3. 23.3%. Uh, Jalen Green, I'm going to say 23.7%. Correct me if I'm wrong. And then Alperin Shangun. It is. 23.7. So, mm -hmm. and then Alperin Shangun was in the 20, somewhere in 22. So you got four guys who are all kind of equal in, in usage percentage. And for people that don't know what usage is, it's basically a stat that tracks like how many plays end with you. I think shooting, is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily track passing. I don't think, or if it does, it's a little, it stupid. doesn't, tra it doesn't track touches is the thing. So like <laughs> us usage can be at times a little bit of a misleading stat because it's just giving it's, it's basically usage is a good indicator of who your play finishers are, right? Who are the guys taking the shots for your team versus somebody who might be distributing the basketball a lot and, and kind of orchestrating what's going where, who's touching it. So like Kevin Porter Jr. And Alperin Shingood, as far as touches go, I, you know, in fact, KPJ for sure is higher towards the top of the pecking order for the Rockets with his touches because he just orchestrated a lot of the, a lot of the offense, even though he was more so middle of the pack with his usage rating. Now, it's worth noting for Jalen Green as well. First half of the season pre All Star break, uh, he was down around twenty two percent usage rating, and then he finished the season uh, twenty five point three percent usage rating post All Star break. So that number did skew a bit higher as the season went on and as he, you know, really became comfortable and kind of started coming into his own a little bit. And see, so we have some statistical evidence that with Jalen Green getting increased usage, he becomes a much, just a much better player, right? A, a better, better, like more statistically productive, um, more efficient, just more so like the all-star player that we wanted to see. And some guys need more usage and more touches to become that type of player. Basketball is a game of rhythm. It's a game of chemistry. The more you get that rhythm and the more you feel confident, if you have the ability, the more you produce. So Christian Wood <clears throat> is in this unique position where the Rockets have two guards that probably should get the shots and the touches. And that when they did, you know, towards the end of the season, that last week or so, uh, two weeks or whatever it was, we were looking at the box scores where Jalen Green and KPJ were taking 20 plus shots and everyone else was taking like 11, you know, or less. Right. And that's that's and they were producing offensively. They still weren't good defensively, but offensively they were they were making things happen, and it was fun and exciting. Now, when you put Christian Wood into that mix, it mucks things up. It turns it more into like a you your turn, my turn, you know. And you can't have three guys taking turns isoing. You can have two, and you can fill that in with like driving kicks and and role players kind of you know getting what they get at the margins and making it all work. You can't do it with three unless they're elite, you know. But even when you take elite big threes that we've seen historically, right? 
one of those big three always takes a step back, you know, st- uh, statistically. I think the only time that didn't happen was with Golden State, where Clay, Steph Curry, and KD were just all always on fire and always producing. But their num- their individual numbers still took a relative hit. But that and that's also because Clay fits that mold of like again, almost like borderline, like super role player, right? Where he was the he was if you're gonna have a big three. Clay Thompson is arguably the best, most complimentary piece of a big three you could have in the NBA, bar none. Even the most biased, homerist Rockets fans who hate Golden State with all their heart would have to agree with that, that you could airdrop Clay Thompson on any team to form a big three, and he would be the absolute best like third banana that you could ask for on a third team because he, he lights out, lights out from three plays <laughs> all NBA level defense doesn't require touches doesn't even dribble the damn basketball like that's exactly I mean, what look, you want airdrop him into those those CP3 hardened rockets which let's make let's oh. carve out some time to touch that at the end airdrop him there it's incredible right so so great point you know he doesn't need the touches he can just move around catch and shoot finish but any other big three you know Chris Bosh had to take a step back. If you look at the Celtics numbers, uh, when that big three formed, they were all aging to some degree, so that counts as well. But statistically, they all took a dip, and it worked for, worked out for them. They got a title. I'm kind of blanking on on other big threes that have formed. I mean, Kyrie, KD, and James Harden. You know, like they LeBron, had other- Kyrie, and K Love. Love was the one who took the statistical dip. Exactly right, and but- so. So someone's oh. always going to take that dip. And so if you got Jalen Green and KPJ and Christian Wood, someone's going to have to take that dip. The issue is Jalen Green's still young. So he's we've seen him like more apt to defer. And maybe that won't be the case next season, but at least as a rookie, you know, I mean, that's just natural, right? He would defer. And it took him a while to get that confidence to just take over. And it also coincided with Christian Wood not playing. So it's not like that issue's been solved necessarily. Christian Wood, contract year. Looking for his like he just got his biggest contract. He's looking for his legit super max, like or max or whatever. He's trying to get paid, paid. Okay. KPJ, restricted free agent, looking for his first big NBA deal. <clears throat> so you have this like pseudo big three of young talent that's not really a big three, but you get the point. Um, so someone's naturally gonna have to take a back seat. And then you throw in the fact that they're all fighting, or two of them are fighting for the biggest contract of their lives, you know, to to feed them and pay them for what they hope is going to be the rest of their lives. Uh, how do you, how do you make that work? I don't think it works. Do you? I think it's, it's bound to have a lot of speed bumps, uh, speed bumps along the way. Right. And that's going to, and that heavily depends on, on Christian Wood and uh, Kevin Porter Jr. And right. Whether or not they're able to set aside their personal agendas for the agenda of the team, right. A, a team first mentality, if you will. And I think that's really dangerous as you alluded to with them both being in a contract year. I'm really, it's, it's such a trip because I feel like there's like a, you know, there's another multiverse out there, a different timeline uh, where if the Rockets did actually run things back with like Christian Wood, James Harden and Russell Westbrook, like I wonder what Christian Wood looks like on a team where he's not the best player, where he's not the alpha, right? Where he's not the most talented guy on the floor. Is he able to mentally take that step back and be like, yo, like, okay, I'm paired with James Harden and Russ bet. I am the third guy. Like I know my role. I'm going to work hard on defense. I'm going to catch lobs. I'm going to do whatever these guys ask me to do offensively. Cause I know that I'm not on their level yet. And I think the issue here with the Rockets is we segued from the James Harden era into the like limbo period, right? The transitional year. And Christian Wood was the Rockets best. It was John Wall and Christian Wood. Like it was the John Wall, Christian Wood show. And C. Wood got those flashes off and it was really exciting and cool. And it's like, oh, this is the big man in the future for the Rockets. And maybe all of that kind of went to his head where it's like, now he's like, yo, like I'm the face of this team, right? Like this is my city. Like, and that's cool. Like him embracing the team, all of that. But now the dynamic is shifting again. And we see, no, like, sorry, man, you're not the future of this team. Jalen Green is the future of this team. Kevin Porter Jr. is is probably more so likely the future of this team than you are. And I think at times we saw those guys not necessarily butting heads on the court, but we saw that, you know, dynamic having issues where he wants to be the guy. He wants to be the number one on the floor. And I wanted to drop this point in a little bit earlier, and I, we kind of got away from it when you were originally talking about, right, Christian Wood's not a five. And I think that is a big problem is what is Christian Wood on the floor? Because unfortunately, right, just, I don't know, that's, that's, we just raise our arms, we shrug, whatever, because unfortunately, offensively, I think Christian Wood loses a lot of his edge when he's not matched up against fives. Like when you, you can, I don't want to say you can neutralize Christian Wood with a wing defender, 
but a really like a sizable wing defender, like a competent, like six, seven, six, eight guy can pretty much stick with Seawood because Seawood doesn't know or can't effectively like posterize a smaller guy. Like he doesn't know how to do that. He can't take a guy who's a wing and like put him down low and like back him down and abuse him down low like that. Christian Wood's offensive advantage comes from being a good outside shot, you know, a good three point shooter. He can pick and pop with the best of them. But then where we see him get a lot of his, you know, easy buckets are the five has to rotate out to him, you know, and he's like closing out on him. And so Christian Wood goes off the catch and drives in and drives in and, you know, initiates contact, finishes at the rim, whatever. And it feels like he can't do that nearly as effectively against other non fives. So the trade off is you run Christian Wood as your five on the floor, you're going to get demolished defensively because he can't hang with other fives on that end. The inverse is you hope that he can effectively outscore the other five offensively, but I just don't think the Rockets win that trade off enough times to warrant the struggles defensively. And I think there's enough of a drop off for Seawood as an offensive force, if you put him at the four or even, I don't know, the three, that defensively he can maybe stick with some of those wing guys. We've seen him on switches. He's a better perimeter defender by far than he is an interior guy. That said, I just don't know if the offensive potency is still there, especially if he's still got that mentality of I'm the number one option, right? Because then he's actually battling against some competent wing defenders that are going to be able to shut him down a little bit more effectively than some of those bigger, more slow-footed fives where he's very clearly got the advantage. Well, and and to to everything you're saying, to the and I agree with you, and to add on to that, what you've described is is he scores in isolation. And what we saw this season was that he is pretty much reluctant to do anything off the ball unless it's posting up. And that's my biggest issue. He doesn't – I have to believe that the Rockets don't run pick and rolls because Christian Wood doesn't want to. Because I don't think Steven – I have issues with Steven Silas as the coach, but I don't think Steven Silas is so inept at coaching, at, at being a head coach, that he just totally 100% ditched the pick and roll. I have to imagine that Christian Wood just doesn't like to run it and wanted to focus on honing his like perimeter skills which is why he's been a perimeter basketball player. I also hate watching him bring the ball up as like the point forward, which Silas enabled and, and I think encouraged. Um, and so and so that's the thing, right? You basically list it out like, hey, he's he's mostly effective in these situations, but is the trade-off beneficial? You know, is the trade-off possession by possession beneficial to the Rockets? Probably not. In addition to that, he's not, he's, re he's willingly reluctant to use arguably his best skill and trait, and that is catching and finishing over the top. The NBA is about basketball is about getting easy points, right? I mean, it's about a lot of things, but one of the main things it's about is easy points. If a team can get easy points, that team has a higher chance of winning if they can reliably do it. And, and an alley-oop lob over the top is pretty much the easiest way to do that. We saw it when he was with James Harden. So it's not like he can't do it. It's not like he's reluctant to do it, but I think you're right on a team. And, and I was going to say this uh, with the Rockets, he's been a 20 and 10 guy an 18 and 10 guy this season. So he probably looks around and says, Hey, look at the numbers. You know, the proof is in the pudding. Like y'all have talent, KPJ, Jalen Green. I'm, you know, I'm not saying he's like a bad teammate, but he probably looks around and says, I'm the guy, you know, like I, I've proven this. I was here before you. I put up the numbers, like, give me the rock. You know, I can do this. You know, he has that 39 point game. He's got his statistical games. So, he, so that goes with the mentality. And that's a big shift from, you know, Hey, I'm playing with James Harden. He runs the show and I'm going to be his sidekick. And that's cool. So that's, that's the main issue. And then also, also, you know, the NBA is kind of like if your big man is going to be a finesse big man, like the, the best version of a finesse big man, I think, is maybe Carl Anthony Towns. Right. I would say Jokic and, and Embiid have more strength um, and they use that strength. Also, not that Carl Anthony Towns isn't strong, but he's just more. I think I think of him as more finesse and skill. And you see even cat like the T-Wolves were a seven seed. Right. They're fighting with the Grizzlies right now. We'll see what happens. But. I guess my point is when you have a finesse big man as one of your best players and one of your most highly paid players, I just don't think it it works. So I think the Rockets would be, would be better suited letting Shangun just flourish um, and then surrounding with more shooting, more defense, more size. Um, you know, and, and would I pay Christian Wood? I wouldn't pay Christian Wood more than $20, $20 million a year and even $20 million. $20 a year, a year he says. <laughs> more, $20 million a year is a lot. So... Food for thought. If it's up to me, I think the Rockets can use this draft and their trade assets to bring in more talent. They can trade Jay Sean Tate, um, assuming that he's not able to be re-upped at, at a reasonable price, assuming that his market value is you know higher than the Rockets should pay. And I would 
trade Christian Wood as well, get some more picks, and then keep willing and dealing because you have a backcourt that can work. You have Alperin Shingun. You have a top five draft pick in this draft, and then you have a ton of assets to maybe bring in another piece. So I don't think you need to go all in on what you've got now. And, and it's tough for fans because they get attached to those players and they can't understand. They see the stats and they see the box score and they're thinking, what are you talking about? Are you crazy? Who, who's giving you these numbers in the league at this position? Um, but I just disagree philosophically because basketball, it's, it's not one size fits all. There's different ways to get it. And addition by subtraction is real. Chemistry is real. Rhythm is real. And defense is very much needed. So those are my two cents. Uh, do you want to wrap this up? By talking, by 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 peeling back some scabs and and revisiting some scars. Yeah, definitely. No, we 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 need to just based on the the discussion amongst a lot of Rockets fans uh, after the series was ended between the Phoenix Suns and the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, we saw a Chris Paul masterclass in Game Six against the pelicans and it's uh, this this should be a fun conversation because i think you and i are actually on deferring ends of the spectrum here which you know i think sometimes you and i coincide a lot in, in the way that we think about the game and you know kind of approach things that the rockets are doing or that the nba at large is, is you know trending or whatever but i think based on what we were you know kind of getting into before we hit sat down and hit the record button i think you and i actually have you know differing viewpoints on this but uh, we'll talk about Chris Paul and his, you know, departure from the Rockets, but his, his night, uh, you know, for the Pelicans to close out that game six was absurd. Went 14 of 14 from the floor. The first player in NBA playoff history to go 14 of 14 from the floor. Every single time down got the Pell or sorry, I got not got the Pels, got the Suns a bucket. He was the first player in history to go 14 of 14. First player in history in playoff history to go 14 of 14. I'm I, that, that is, that's, that's per the broadcast because apparently I think Wilt, did it, but I don't think it was playoffs. Um, I'm almost again, I'm positive quoting this from the broadcast. I'm almost positive that Yao Ming was 13 of 13 against the Mavericks in 2004. That and that's possible because I think it, at one point they had mentioned when he was 13 of 13 that that is the most anybody's ever gone like historically, you know, from shooting from the floor without a miss in the playoffs. And then he hit the 14 of 14, and it was like that's the most anybody's ever had, period. Like can, in the playoffs, can you look up. Can you look up Yao in um, – it was either – I think it was game one or two of 2004 or, two, or 2005. I always forget what year that was. It was 04. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was 04 um, against Dallas. But, look, watching that go down last night gave me shades of closing the Jazz out in game five uh, in 2018. Was it game five? Yeah, it was game five, yeah. Um, which would have been Rockets – Jazz. would have been in Houston, I think. 13 of 14 for Yao Ming in game two on the road against Dallas. There you go. That's the game where Tracy McGrady hit that game winner and also dunked over Sean Bradley classic. So, um, so it gave me shades of when he, what he dropped like 41 against the jazz when he closed them out that season. I remember, I'll never forget. I was 41 and a bunch of triples too. Like I, I feel like he, what, it was like seven triples that game, seven or eight triples. It was I can't remember. Ridiculous. It was just crazy at the end. I remember I was in the law school. I was, I was in law school. I was studying for finals in the library. And I took a break to obviously watch that game because I, you know, <laughs> not gonna miss the Rockets playoff game. And so um I remember <clears throat> I remember being like sad because the Rockets started going down. And I was thinking, oh man, are we about to like really go back to like game six with Utah and, and kind of, you know, shades of old Rockets like blowing it. And then he just took over and I was like yelling. I was so loud in in the library. People were looking at me and stuff. But um, but man, Chris Paul closeout games. I mean the people have been posting the stats. I don't have it memorized, but Chris Paul in closeout games is an animal. Is one of the best players ever. And so, uh, biased Houston. If anyone follows Will, shout out to Will. I got Adam today, so sorry about that, Will. But I'm very sensitive about uh, about this topic because people misrepresent it so drastically, in my opinion, that it just pisses me off. Will said, and I will quote: Will says, "Let us not." He tweets this today. Let us not rewrite history. CP3 was coming off a series where he couldn't beat Kevon Looney off the dribble. Russ was a perennial MVP candidate. Maybe trading for Russ wasn't the best idea. There's no maybe about that. It wasn't. But something needed to be done. We could not run that 2019 team back in good faith. So first of all, Will, that's a misuse of the term good faith, but we won't go into that. But the, the, the notion that CP3 couldn't beat Looney off the dribble pisses me off because what was that face 
that faces he couldn't beat Looney off the dribble. That's why I knew we were going to be on deferring ends. This now I'm not again. I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you say your piece, and I'll get into my side of things. But you know, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, he couldn't. But that's the thing, right? Is that on him, or is that on your coach for not changing your game plan? You don't have to beat someone off the dribble. Like the, the, the basketball is not I, about isoing and beating your guy off the dribble. That's one part of the game. That's the that's the way the Rockets played those two years, right? But as your coach and James Harden. It was the coach played the way James Harden wanted to play. James Harden did not want to play differently. And this is why they didn't get along. This is why they blew up and, and the trade happened because Chris Paul was saying, Hey, I don't want to do this. Right. Because he probably knew like, yo, I'm playing hurt. I can't blow by these guys. Let's let me do what I do, which is point God. You do what you do, which is MVP to guard and let's win basketball games. And James Harden was like, nah, dude, did you see me? I just dropped 36 a night. Like you're playing my way. I'm not playing your way. And so that's the thing. Two months. I think it was February, two months before the, the the series against the Warriors that year in 2019. Chris Paul had 24 points and 17 assists with James Harden out of the game, and the Rockets beat the Warriors in Golden State. Okay? Kenneth <clears throat> Reed went off that game. I will have everybody know. I remember that game. It was great. <laughs> I, listen, I listened to it on the ride home from the University of Houston because I was staying late to do a project or something because I was still in school, and I was like listening in the radio, and I remember I missed like the first few minutes of the first quarter, turned on the radio, and I'm like, Rockets are up. Kenneth Farid hits a three. I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like, I was That was a great game to listen to. Shout out to Craig Ackerman who had the uh, – I believe – wait, no. That was a road game. I think it was Matt Thomas who had the road call. Yeah. If I'm not so, mistaken. So that's because Chris Paul played point guard, right? Look at what's Chris Paul doing now? Is he just taking guys off the dribble, play after play after play? No, he's running an offense and then he's getting to his spot and hitting the mid range, right? I don't need him to beat Kevon Looney off the dribble. I just need him to run the offense to get open shots for guys and then to go to his mid range spot when the game is on the line. That's what he's always done. So this whole, he couldn't beat. Yeah. Did he have a bad series? Yeah. He did have a bad series against the Warriors. You know what else happened? Um, First and foremost, right? <laughs> Rock, Rockets fans always it's funny because the same Rockets fans that will that will say, well, Harden didn't beat KD's Warriors. That team was so good, are the same ones that say you had to trade Chris Paul because they couldn't beat the Warriors. Hey guys, it was the Warriors. Okay. It was one of the best teams of all time. KD went down, and guess what? Those Rockets were not built to play against those Warriors without Kevin Durant. Any any actual Rockets fan that watched those games knows that. Right. When you take Kevin Durant out of the equation and Steph Curry and Clay Thompson are just running baseline to baseline, running off of a Draymond illegal screen, getting open. The Rockets could never deal with that. They were never built to deal with that. They were built to grind out ISOs and to force the Warriors to get away from what made them special by grinding out ISOs. That's why they were that's why they had them on the ropes in 2018. Right. That's why that series was neck to neck until KD went out even with the Rockets having a worse team without an actual three guard that season, uh, a small forward, right? So, and KD went out for a game and a half, and that's all it took, right? So the Rockets were not built to play that against that team. James Harden was not built to play defense that way. James Harden is not chasing guys off screens and like around screens and sticking to his man. Never been his game. <clears throat> Their whole thing was we're going to switch everything, <clears throat> And we're gonna make you ISO. You take KD. I can the give equation. you a break if you. I can give you a break if you just need to call for a little bit. Okay, I'll let you go. Sorry, just, I'm, I'm just, so no, I'm just, I'm just messing with you because I. It's like every, you just lean it over. You're like, so I'm just giving you a chance. <laughs> but, but, but that's the thing, right? You take KD out of the equation. All of a sudden, they're running like this pseudo triangle with like motion, and you know, it's just, it's just like it's, it's you know, one of the best offenses we've ever seen in the NBA, and it's also the reason that they're still potent without Kevin Durant. Right. With Jordan Poole out of nowhere. Credit to Jordan Poole, but credit to Andrew Wiggins. But that's why they can take guys that can just catch and shoot that have size and length that can just run around, catch and shoot, play a little bit of ISO when they need to and keep it moving. That's why this thing works. So. And then. KD and tore then, his Achilles. KD tore his Achilles. Clay Thompson blew his knee out. And you still make the trade. Oh, we couldn't beat the Warriors. Cool. The Warriors were done. LeBron went, to, AD got traded to the Lakers. That was it. That was it. Who made the Western Conference Finals in the bubble? The Nuggets. You tell me the Rockets couldn't beat the Nuggets with Capella, who was Jokic's kryptonite? If, if you remember that matchup as well? So yeah, get out of here with that, man. Jokic, Jokic was, you know, barbecue chicken when it came to Clint Capella. People Clint say, run the floor with the best of them. He was. People say, oh, who's to say Chris Paul wouldn't rehab? Yo, check this out, guys. Um, first of all, 
Use the same arguments that you use for Harden, right? Which was, oh, his game will age well because it's skill-based. Same with Chris Paul. Yeah, he's fast and quick twitch, but he's he's one of the most skilled point guards ever, okay? That's why it's still working at age 37, okay? Also, guys rehab. Like, I, I have faith in a guy, uh, one of the best point guards ever, to rehab and to get better, and that's what he did. Who knows he goes vegan or whatever, but, like, guys rehab. He was playing hurt that season. He deserves deference for that. And then finally... If even if you want to trade him, his value was at its lowest point when they traded him. That's why they included the pick swaps. That's why all that shit happened, right? Which again was at James Harden's direction. James Harden said it's either me or him. That's why they made the trade. So whenever you want to criticize the trade, go right back to Harden. And that that's the one thing I will never, never, never let Harden off the hook for. He blew that up intentionally. Right. But yeah. last point I'll make, and then you take it away. <laughs> if you want to trade him, at least run it back, improve his trade value, and then trade him. You don't trade him at his lowest point, right? So for all those reasons, stop defending that trade. Stop the bullshit with, oh, well, who would – you couldn't get past Kevon Looney. There's different ways to play basketball. He could still drive and kick and draw a defender and kick it, right? Like, give me a break. So first off, and this is, this is usually my mentality towards – everything and anything in, in life and in basketball, whatever things are very rarely as black and white as people try to make them seem right. There's so much more gray area in all these discussions, which is why Twitter is such a it's Twitter is both an incredible place and like just a, a cesspool for a lot of different reasons, right? Because it's hard to get into any really like thorough debate conversation when you've only got 280 characters to try and illustrate a point. And even then, if you're trying to get it across multiple tweets, whatever, like people are going to take what you say and misconstrue it out of context, whatever. So I do agree and i and I, I i can't defend the trade right like i'm not gonna sit here and try and say it was the right move i understand a lot of the mentality behind the move and a big part of that stems from you you can strip it down to just it's bare bolts whatever the essence was and the essence was james harden was done and fed up with chris paul james harden wanted a different running mate and so you i think there's a lot more variables than just that i think there's a lot of indictment like i think mike d'antoni gets off scot free a lot which you know he shouldn't i think there's a, there needs to be a lot more blame personally for me i think i give most if not like again not all the blame right there's there's a little blame to be had for you know for tillman fertita jumping in and wanting to you know push through the trade and just make it happen there's blame for daryl Morey for not putting his foot down and basically being like we're not doing this there's blame for mike d'antoni there's blame for james Harden. there's even blame for chris paul because ultimately you get into all these different areas, right? And where we can assign certain levels of blame. And I get the mentality of like Chris realizing like he can't do like the ISO thing anymore. And, you know, they can't just hunt for mismatches and he can't take advantage of them the same way that he did in 2017, 2018, when the Rockets went to game seven, toe to toe with the Warriors, all that wasn't the same player. Maybe take a step back physically, not all there. Sure. Like CP3 was struggling with that. To expect the Rockets to change their entire dynamic of what was making them successful, you know, just to cater to to him, you know, it's no, kind of tough. And no, again, I put, I, no, 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 I put, I put some of that on no. Mike D'Antoni. I put some of that on Mike no. D'Antoni. No, what? No, I, I hate that. To think that the Rockets had to change their whole basketball is about adjusting. If it's not, then what the what is the coach for? What do we get on coaches for? Which for is not which adjusting. Is why, which is for why not I think adjusting. The, which is why I think a part of a, a chunk of it falls on Mike D'Antoni for not realizing, yo, CP3 doesn't have it in his bag anymore. This season, whatever, he's regressed. He can't blow by defenders. He can't, you know, he's not as effective in isolation, right? Against, you know, switching on to bigs and trying to expose them that way. We need to change the way that we're playing. That you have said, Luke coaching that team, they switch it up and they win. And, and, sure. And that's why. So again, shoulder more of the blame onto Mike D'Antoni. Absolutely. So I think that in and of itself is an area of concern. I think it's frustrating that the Rockets didn't like that, that those conversations maybe weren't had like earlier in the season. And again, maybe you, you force some of that blame onto onto James Harden as well. If James but Harden Chris, didn't want to. He didn't want to switch up. He didn't. That's what and, people and need that's, to understand. Uh, that, that's the yes. truth. And so for all of those reasons, though, I do wonder if the Rockets looked at again. They looked at what they had with Chris Paul, and they were like, okay. You know, if there's not a, a level of thinking, yo, this guy can get back to where physically he can continue to play the way that we want to play, which is, which is hunt isos, you know, slow the game down in the half court, all of this, you know, let James Harden continue to be the MVP two guard, right? We don't want to play two different styles. We want to keep doing the Mike D'Antoni, James Harden show, right? If that was the organization's mentality, then going into that offseason, if they didn't have this idea that Chris Paul could get physically better back to a point where he could continue to do that, 
that's where some of the, again, like, okay, we've got to flip this guy. We got to do something different. We got to break so it up. Information I have, sorry. And, and again, James Harden wanted him out. I think that's, that's the biggest crux of the argument is James Harden wanted him gone. Once that decision was made, that was game over. Because if, if, if James Harden made up his mind and was like, I need this guy gone. I can't, it, he, he doesn't have the juice anymore. Go get me Russ. Russ wants out of OKC. That's my guy. That's and it. At that point, James Harden was still a top five player. And that was it, right? You, you got to make it. that move in that case. But I, I understand some of the mentality of looking at what Chris Paul did in that series. I don't think anybody, even if we go back and dig up old tweets and stuff, right? I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are like, yo, Chris Paul's washed. Like he doesn't look the same. And yes, there's an idea that he has that cerebral level of play and that he would be able to age well. But that doesn't mean that his him aging well would have benefited and, and worked well with what the Rockets were trying to do with him being the number two to James Harden, right? Maybe there's no, an idea. No, Again, no. if we rewind the time, if we no. rewind the clock and go all the way back to then and think, okay, yeah, Chris Paul can age well and he could still run a team and he can be that, you know, floor general point guard and still do. But if you need Chris Paul to do, to be the the Robin to James Harden's Batman, or at the you know to to be Superman when James Harden's not on the floor, I think there was a very legitimate argument that that no. version of Chris Paul wasn't still there. No, wrong. Yes, correct. No, it's wrong. It's it's just wrong. you're not going to change. You're not going to change my. I opinion reject the okay. idea of of living in the moment. Oh, he looks washed. Oh my God. Okay, if that if you make decisions based on that respectfully you're not smart okay if you make decisions based on just what you see in a vacuum without taking any time to let that sit and marinate without taking any time to survey the landscape and realize hey the warriors are done okay your biggest rival the the one thing in your way is gone okay if you don't take the time to understand hey this guy was playing hurt maybe he can rehab hey we've been we've been playing a style of basketball that maybe um, contributed to this guy getting hurt, right? Overexerting him in isolations. Like that's the easiest way to get hurt. Hey, maybe we didn't adjust, right? All of these things. Uh, hey, yeah, all the different variables. Again, yeah, it's, not, it's not black and white. It's not black no, and white. It no, never is not, black and white. It's not black and white, but it's very easy to see that the one thing they did, trade him in the manner they did for the package they did was dumb as shit, okay? I, at the time, I hated it. You know, I, I might have, I might have what tried mean, to at talk the time. To, we still, we still hate it. It was, yeah, well, it was no, still I'm, the worst trade in franchise history. Yeah, but, but you're, saying, you're saying that a lot of people back then would be like, oh, he was washed. A lot of people were, but they were in the moment, right? If you're going to make decisions based on being a prisoner of the moment, like that's not how you run an organization. No, that's but not how you even, run a even, go, even going away from just like, I'm, I'm not trying, trying to talk about being a prisoner of the moment. If you're looking at the longstanding future of the organization, you think, okay, what do we have right now? Right. Do we risk do we risk giving Chris Paul the chance to get back to a level where we think? Like, there's again, no that risk. Was, there's no, no risk. His value was at an all-time low. The only risk, there's no risk. The only thing is you're trying to improve it. No, the, it doesn't the get risk, worse. No, no, no. The risk is literally not having another championship window, right? Because if you run it back and Chris Paul is even worse the next season or at best on par with how he was that year, then you're like, shit, we wasted another year of James Harden's prime, right? When, again, you That's could be like, did. okay, what do we... But they and they did, gave but, up any and they gave up any asset that they had in the process. Now, in, look, you, in you that moment, it. You in that it. moment, look. they thought in that moment, dude, they thought Russell Westbrook no. because of James Harden and all the again the internal whatever dialogue was all right. Russ is an Iron Man, right? Because at that point he had been an Iron Man, which is ridiculous. And then he came to the Rockets and was actually dealing with injuries for like the first time in his career, like significant he also injuries. Got besides the consecutive first round series look here, here's here's what happened this was the thinking okay daryl moore even said it we're not trading chris paul he didn't say that because he didn't mean it he said that because he meant it they were not they were trying to let that thing die and fi figure it out later then paul george uh the the clipper stuff with paul george happened, OKC. yes and then russ becomes available james harden realized that from a back channel okay this is not me speculating this is what happened james harden realized that from talking to russ and he was like yo russ is available go get him Right. And I think this is the part that I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm, I think Harden was like, look, if, if there's a way to get him without giving up Chris, cool. And they tried and that didn't happen. And so Harden was like, I don't care. Get him, you know, me or him. Go get Russ. And they did. And so you can blame uh, Tillman for his 5 percent comment. I think he deserves some blame for that. You can blame Daryl Morey for doing it, all that stuff. But the the domino that started that whole thing was James Harden and it's hard. It's hard to go against your franchise player, perennial MVP candidate, MVP winner, top two MVP finisher after a 36 point per game season. I get that, um, but he made that decision, and he and he basically forced them to trade those picks, 
and do what they had to do to get them. And they panicked and they did it. And, and I have less blame for them panicking and doing it because of the way that the league is structured, right? It's it's based around having top tier talent. And so they're thinking, hey, we can't lose. If we lose Harden, it's over. So we got to accommodate Harden. And, and again, he basically the, held the, them, the, held their feet to the fire in that position. That, the, that's the why one. the blame goes on Harden. Yes, absolutely. And that's that's the logic. I apologize. I, and it, that's the logic that I'm trying to sit here and defend. Put yourself in James Harden's shoes, right? He's looking at Chris Paul. Maybe James Harden was a prisoner of the moment. Sure. He's looking at Chris Paul and thinking, okay, we're playing this style. We took Golden State to game seven playing this style. I'm still a top five guy in the league. I've got a finite amount of time of being a top five guy in the league. Go get me somebody who can mirror this style, who can do what we tried to do. And again, like we, we saw it this past season with LeBron, right? The GM making terrible decisions for the Lakers. He goes out and scoops up Russ. And now yeah, and it was a terrible again. idea. And we and all it knew was, it. And it was. It was absolutely an atrocious decision. I'm not. And, what, the, and what did the Lakers do in the process? They forfeited any valuable trade assets they had to the point where all they had was a 2027 first round pick and Taylor Horton Tucker. Absolutely. And that's, and that's not, the position I'm, they are still in. I'm not defending the decision to go do it, I'm defending the logic behind it, unfortunately, because I get the logic, right? If there had been another star, whatever, on the market that James Harden was like, go get me him instead of, I don't know, right? Maybe Russ never becomes available and he's still looking at Chris and he's like, yo, like I need somebody better than this. Go get me an, another, go get me somebody else because he can't run it back because if this is the no, ceiling I'm, with him. I'm going to reject that too because James Harden was doing, what was James Harden doing? He was moping on the court, dude. Remember the whole, oh, he has gravity standing at half court. Yeah, okay. He did that because he was moping. He was doing exactly what, if you've ever played a sport and your teammate is pissed off at you and intentionally starts slacking to piss you off, right? That's what he was doing. He was like, all right, you, you still got it? Cool, show me. And he would just stand there. They would argue in practice. Exactly, because like he was would argue on with a team playing. That, like, that again, so all of that, right? He, I'm defending that logic. Like James Harden was done with Chris Paul. He wanted a different running mate. And so when that situation presented itself, again, I'm not defending the trade. The trade was still horrendous. Like that's not the my logic point is here. stupid though, too. Look, if you're a if you're a, a smart basketball player, you look at Chris Paul and say, Okay, obviously we're not going like ISO for ISO, right? If you're a smart basketball player, you shouldn't even rely on ISO for ISO. That shit does it. It only worked in a vacuum that one year, and it was special. But that's like a it's a rare occurrence. It does that shit doesn't happen, right? Um, you accommodate playing basketball. You move. <clears throat> you move off the ball. How about that? For starters, you move off the ball for for starters, especially when you have arguably the greatest point guard of all time, definitely a top five point guard of all time. You move off the goddamn ball, right? I'm not I'm not letting Harden off the hook. That's, and he, I'm not trying, again, I'm not trying to let stubborn. Harden off the hook. I'm putting He's myself stubborn. in his shoes and presenting probably what was going through his head at the time. And that's where no, the frustrating I, thing is. I, right? I know what was going through his head at the time, but I'm just saying like, that's being a prison. He was being a prisoner of the moment. Right. And he nuked the whole thing. I mean, that's, that's it. Right. So yeah, I get the lie. I get where his head was at, but it doesn't mean his head was in a remotely right place. No, you know? Yeah. So, it's... so I look People say something needed to be done. Yeah. Yeah. You take those assets that you have and you improve around James Harden and Chris Paul. You don't just take all those assets, slap them onto Chris Paul and ship them out for something that you perceive to be slightly better because it wasn't Here's slightly it. better. It was actually significantly worse. And now we're in the position we're in. We're lucky that we got Jalen Green. We're lucky that we traded Harden and, and got some of that draft capital, be capital back. But without that, disastrous. And again, they tried to get Jimmy Butler, right? So like you have those picks, pick swaps, whatever. Why not upgrade around CP3 and James Harden to let CP3 kind of fall back more into the role that he's in now where he's a point guard first and he becomes this like takeover player when he's needed to be instead of every game switch off ISO, ISO, boom, boom. You let Harden continue to be Harden and then you upgrade around them and find another piece to be that other piece, you know? And that and that should have been the Jimmy Butler trade. Shout out to Tom Thibodeau for tanking that possibility. Uh, that should have been the Jimmy Butler trade. And then, right, you've got James Harden, Jimmy Butler doing the heavy lifting on a nightly basis. CP3 steps up when he needs to. That absolutely should have been the dynamic. And again, it got to a point, though, where at the end of that season, as short-sighted as, as it may have been, James Harden was done. That, re that relationship was fractured. And that is possibly going to be the ultimate referendum on James Harden. If he doesn't make it work with Joel Embiid in Philadelphia, like if, if the, if this situation ends poorly and he either forces his way out or, or leaves, whatever, they don't extend it. I don't know. Right. I don't know how that relationship's going to end, 
hopefully a title for James. I still want to see that, especially now that he's not playing for the Brooklyn Nets. I'm like, I have zero qualms about like rooting for James Harden in the Eastern Conference. Like, hey, go get your chip, James. Sure. I'm, that I'm said, just, I mean, it's cool. I'm indifferent. I'm not rooting against him, but I'm not like excited. I'm not wearing, like, I'm not going to go buy a James Harden, like, Sixers jersey, but at the same time, like, I don't have a vested interest in it. I will say I'm a big fan of what the Boston Celtics are doing, especially because the Rockets are about to be Boston Celtics 2.0 with all of Brooklyn's draft capital. But, like, you look at James Harden, right? He had the all, all the, the fractured relationships with each of his star teammates here in Houston, and he goes to Brooklyn, and that situation devolves. Granted, I don't think that's James Harden's fault. I think there was a lot of mess around, obviously, Kyrie Irving, KD. Like, that whole situation was a ticking time bomb. Now he's in Philly with Joel Embiid, and, and now he's like playing second fiddle to him. And Embiid is playing like an MVP candidate. So if James Harden can't get that one figured out and can't somehow win or at least make it to like the finals and really like make a push with Embiid, and if that relationship starts to fall apart, there's a common denominator here, and it's James Harden. And again, like I, like you, I will never forgive him for being the catalyst to what ended that you know, rain here in Houston. Cause that two years with CP three, even though that second year was a down year, even though it ended in such a bad way with that playoff exit, you know, if they had just been willing to ride it out for one more season, the Rockets would have absolutely been the favorites in the bubble that year. Right. And I think that's the crazy thing is like that bubble, that rest, that three months off in the middle of the season would have done would have wonders been. for Chris Paul, right? Yeah. He would have gone into the playoffs fresh, recharged. I mean, we saw how much of a, he was insane in that first round series against the Rockets playing for OKC. And you're telling me that that Rockets team, that Rockets team would have absolutely dismantled the Lakers team that went on to win in the bubble that year. They wouldn't have had to trade Chris Paul. And ultimately, James Harden and Chris Paul would have still been here in Houston. They wouldn't have had to trade Clint Capella. Yep, they would, they, they would. Again, that team would still be fighting for chips to this day had they not blown it up that offseason, had they just given it one more year to run it back. And again, I think the problem is, you know, <laughs> The, the, the foresight from James Harden and for the rest of the front office, right, just wasn't quite there. Maybe there were some who no. saw that that was going to be the wrong. Maybe there were some who saw that that wasn't going to be the right decision, but they didn't put their feet down. They didn't. They, they didn't put their feet down. Against it. Yes, they didn't they put did. their like, feet down. And that's, that's I don't, like you will never convince me to th think that Daryl Morey was like, yo, this is the right trade. Like, no, like because Russell Westbrook was so anti-analytics. The guys, the guys right? that are in the the guys that are in the Rockets front office now are still there. Eli Whitus, Rafael Stone was in that front office, right? Because yep. those guys are still there. They're not stupid, you know? No. So did, did they do it because they thought, to Will's tweet, something had to be done? No, man. They did it because Harden said, yo, do it or I'm gone. You know, do it yep. or you – and we've, and we've seen, now that we've seen James Harden make trade demands, okay, we've seen it twice. We saw it in Houston. We saw it in Brooklyn. We see what happens when he decides he's done, right? He will nuke your shit, okay? He will start half-assing it on the court. Longest yard style, shave points, legit. We've seen it. He will cause all sorts of locker room drama. We've but seen first it. he'll make. But first he'll make it a point to show, yo, this is who you're losing, and then he'll go and pout. Like remember right. when he started the season right. in Houston? Uh, you know, yeah, not amazing. last year, whatever. Forty four, you know, like does, seventeen or whatever he had. Yeah, like the insane, Blazers. the insane 40, 40, 15 games, and then he does that like two or three games in a row, and he's like, all right, so this is me playing Superman. Now I'm going to like tone it all back and like watch you guys struggle. So, right. And that's honestly, that's like diabolical. So like, don't lose sight of like how diabolical that is and how just damning and damaging that is to a team, man. You're supposed to be on a team. And then you see your teammate just totally turn his back. You're just like, yo, are you serious? Who, who has done that in history? People don't, players don't do that. So, um, so look, that's the point, right? Like we've seen James Harden make his trade demands and we've seen what happens when he does so he the rockets were staring down that barrel and they were like shit uh we got to trade chris otherwise we lose james and james is our franchise and we've committed to him so we can't do that so i mean you can say oh something had to be done but no man cooler heads typically prevail in those situations they should have and the guys in that front office are smart and there's still some of the guys that are in the current front office so if you're telling me they looked around and said hey kevin durant tore his achilles and signed with brooklyn Clay is out for the season, so Golden State's no longer in our way. AD's going to LA. I can't remember if the Russell Westbrook. I think AD was already in LA. I think so. When that, when that trade happened, so AD's in LA, and the rest of the shit is wide open. You know, and they looked at that and said, "No, we got to do it." No, they did it because James Harden forced them to do it. So the retroactive justification is stupid, man. I mean. Look at any player through history. Look at the most cerebral players through history. And I, if you want to clown that term, go for it. You're an idiot. 
um, cerebral players make things happen, right? Look at LeBron James. How is he aging? Pretty well. Even James Harden. He's not the same James Harden, but he still gives you like 20, 10, and 8, right? Because he's smart. Jason Kidd. Jason Kidd made an impact. Even as a 37, 38-year-old, right? Won a title with the Mavs. Like, just go down the go down the line. Tim Duncan, right? Even when he lost, you know, the fire of being the Tim Duncan, um, he was still winning, uh, competing for championships and winning championships late in his career because he's smart. Smart players get past their physical limitations when they get older. And Chris Paul is doing exactly that because he's got something. The skill. Something had to be done with that Rockets team. It wasn't trade Chris Paul. It was they it wasn't. Needed to adjust, in retrospect, they, need, they needed to adjust what their approach was to the game. And again, that's why to me, the guy who gets off mostly scot free from this conversation for whatever reason is Mike D'Antoni, and he should be the guy who shoulders most, if not again. I put him and James Harden kind of on the same level of blame for like this situation. Yeah, me too. And you know, I, I think there's again other situations where you maybe look at Daryl, like Daryl Moore should have locked James Harden and Chris Paul in a broom closet somewhere. I mean, like you're not coming out until you resolve this shit. Like, just that should have been the move, and that didn't happen. So, you know, I, I definitely think that there's again little bits of blame to go around, but the most of the blame goes to James Harden, Mike D'Antoni. Yeah, and Mike D'Antoni even said it recently on on a podcast I saw. He was talking about the 0 for 27, and he was saying, you know, what am I supposed to tell these guys to do something different? And I'm just like, yes, asshole. Yes, you are. You know, that's the point. When you're blowing a lead in a do or die situation, you try something different. Yes, you do. So, yeah, they, they all deserve blame, man. I mean, you're looking at Chris Paul. You've used him in this certain way that worked. Now he's hurt. It's not working that way anymore. And you don't think, okay, let's try something different to make it work. You think, now nah, let's just run it to death to the point that, James Harden goes to the podium and says, I know exactly what needed to be done. You know what he meant in that situation? It was trade Chris Paul. Get Chris Paul off my team. He went. <laughs> I don't know if I should say this. He 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 marched into an office directly after that game and said, him or me, get him gone. Okay. So when you want to, when you want to blame or say, oh, Chris Paul had to be traded, he didn't even give it a chance, dude. He, he had his mind made up when that series was over. He probably had his mind made up as the series was happening he might have even had his mind made up before the series ever started but as soon as it ended he had his mind made up and he did what he did and the rest is history and we're still talking about it to this day for a reason so i i would just i can't stand anyone retroactively justifying that shit smart people that are paid big bucks know the deal and they were held hostage by harden and they really had no choice you know you could you could again you could point to certain people to blame them and to what degrees of blame. And I won't disagree with that, but the domino that started it all is James Harden. And that domino was enabled and sided with by Mike D'Antoni. So I'm with you, you know, so, so let's not rewrite history with that bullshit, man. Let's just keep it 100. Ciento. Chris Paul shouldn't have been traded. That team is still contending. If Chris Paul doesn't get traded, if that team uses the assets it used to trade Chris Paul to actually upgrade elsewhere on the roster, they become even better. The rest of the West was done. It was just LeBron and AD, only thing in your way. Warriors were done. And <clears throat> that was all in place before the trade was made. So there's no excuse to, to say, oh, my God, what were they supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to readjust, come back, upgrade, and, and, and do it again. So that's all I got to say about that. Should we wrap it up? Nothing. I got nothing else to add. You know, it's 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 still like a fresh wound, even though we're talking about it's. I mean, we're almost four years removed from it now, which is kind of absurd to think about. Three years. Um, three years. Oh, three years. You're right. I can't do math. Math. Is July, hard. July 2019. Um, I'll never forget. Dude, I was studying for the bar. I took a break to like just lay down and get on Twitter, and then I got I got the notification. There's a video of me somewhere like at work, like because I was working my day job, like at the bakery that I used to be at. And there's a video of somebody who came into the room um, and like somebody told me that like somebody walked in. Uh, there was a security guard that used to come in and like we would chop it up, talk about hoop. And he came in. He was like, yo, did you see the news? Did you see the trade? And I was like, what trade? And I like immediately like ran to the back. I was on my phone and one of my uh, employees came back. And she like saw me sitting down freaking out in the office. She videotaped it. And every year it's like, I think she like posted on Snapchat or some shit. And so like every year pops up like on her Snapchat memories. She like sends it to me now. <laughs> and it's me like in the office, like on my phone going, Oh my God. Like I'm like, I'm losing it <laughs> because I'm like reading the trade 
and I could not in that moment fathom what was going down. And yeah, it was tough. It was tough. Yeah, man, I got I got the woj the woj bomb, and my jaw dropped. My heart, you know, it was just like, please tell me this is not real, man. Please tell me this is not real, you know. And it was real, and and the rest is history, man. So look, blame James Harden for that. That is his fault. That was his doing, completely his doing. Just like but it's LeBron. all good because we have Jalen Green now. And that's what matters. Yeah. Hey, hey, we move on, man. But but yeah, I just want to. I just have to. I'll, I'll always be the first one to say, do not tell me we had to trade Chris Paul because he couldn't get past Kevon Looney. If your basketball analysis is that limited, then dog, you need to watch some more basketball and you need to play some more basketball. There's more ways to get it than blowing by one guy in isolation, right? That's not the game of basketball. That's one small component of the game of basketball. It's not the entire game. If you're telling me the guys who get paid millions of dollars can't sit there and adjust and draw up a play, if you're telling me that the best coaches of all time aren't known for adjusting what is Pop known for doing? Adjusting, you know? If, if you're telling me the best coaches of all time are not known for adjusting and that we should have just continued to do it because there was no other way, I just can't take you seriously. I, I can only I can only assume that you're just pushing an agenda to cope and make yourself feel better, but that's not the case. Maybe Mike D'Antoni shouldn't be widely regarded as one of the best coaches of all time. He's not. He's not. For that reason, though, because he's a one-trick pony. He, he puts shit in place. He's got a good system, right? He's a smart guy, but once someone counteracts that, he doesn't do anything. That's why he's that and, and bad luck. But that's part of the game. When you get bad luck, when you get injury luck, bad injury luck, you got to adjust, man. And he's just like, nah, full full head of steam. Let's just go. And it doesn't work out. But but yeah, let's wrap it up there, man. Um, this is the premier Houston Rockets podcast. I like that tagline. I made it up, but it is. <laughs> It is your Nuero Uno podcast for uh, Houston Rockets Talk. Look, I'm Roosh Williams, host of the Noble and Roosh Show. Go check that out. Follow us on Twitter. Jackson Gatlin hosts, you know, 10,000 podcasts. I'm, I'm lucky enough that he takes time out of his day to do this one with me. Um, anything else? Closing thoughts? I would say subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a, a five-star rating if you can on the podcast, on the Apple Podcast um, app. Leave a comment, you know. You know what? Leave a comment on your thoughts on Chris Paul. Uh, any any interaction we get in the comments, we, we try to do our best to kind of talk to you guys and respond to you guys. So do us that favor if you can. Um, and, yeah, we, we just started this as episode four. We're going to keep it moving. I'm excited for the the momentum we've gained, and it's not even it's, – it's the off season. Like, nothing's even happened. So when shit starts to pop off, we're, uh, we're going to keep it moving, man. So stick with us. Anything else, Jackson? Just uh, not not only drop a comment about your thoughts on Chris Paul, because obviously that's digging up, you know, old wounds here for Rockets fans. Uh, but, you know, let us know about your comments from the earlier discussion, right, about Jay Sean Tate, kind of your thoughts on, on his role moving forward, the thoughts that we shared about Christian Wood. Let us know any thoughts you have on all three of kind of the topics that we covered in today's show. And then, yeah, as far as the uh, subscribers, I mean, thank you guys for all the support. Like we just just dropped this. This is episode number four. Um, we've had a lot of fun doing these. This is something that Roosh and I talked about for a while and we were, you know, kind of, you know, going back and forth debating whether we wanted to try and roll it out at the end of the season or hold off till next season. I'm really happy that we did roll it out when we did. Uh, the reception has been incredible. We are at 950 subscribers at the time of this recording. So we are 50 away from our goal of hitting a thousand. Um, which is like, that's kind of our short term goal. And that's a, a, a nice milestone uh, on the, the YouTube side of things. So yeah, go drop us a subscription. If you haven't yet, uh, we'd sincerely appreciate it. Drop the reviews on Apple. Those would help us out a ton. Uh, it helps the algorithm. You can even just go to YouTube and drop, you drop a little hashtag for the algorithm. We'd love that. Um, Cause then it, ser it serves up this video to other Rockets fans who may or may not know about hey, the podcast yet. Hey, <laughs> for the house, for the team, for the, for algorithm. the algorithm for for no it's got to be for d algorithm that's what it's yeah please if anyone's made it this far in the podcast please hashtag for capital d algorithm i'd get a, an enormous kick out of that so but yeah thank you for uh, you know for all the support guys we're we're going to keep it moving i mean we take time out of our day to do this to serve it up so that you know people can have something to kind of kind of keep them going in the off season when there's really nothing else happening until we get more going with the draft. So we're going to keep pumping them out. We're going to do a little pump, a little dump. And uh, I won't rhyme anything else with that. We'll keep it there. So yeah, I hated that. That was awful. It was a terrible <laughs> way to end the show. Go follow him at Roosh Williams on the bird app. You can follow me at JT Gatlin. Of course, subscribe to the show. Check it out there. You can follow the show at state of rockets on Twitter as well. Uh, that's where we drop all the show links, all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, that's going to do it, man. Our double.
we'll wrap it there. Appreciate you guys. Till the next time.